Amen. You may be seated. Last week, we started a sermon series, a new series called Unstuck. And what we've been doing is we've been working through the book of Hebrews and identifying areas where it talks about uh, things that make us stuck in our faith, whether that be sin or last week we talked about spiritual plateau. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, by now you ought to be teachers, but you still need milk. You're not, we haven't moved on to solid foods yet. We talked about the idea that growth happens when we learn. We learn about God and some of those elementary principles that the writer talked about. We mentioned that growth happens when we see, when we see the example of others and we're challenged and inspired by them. We said growth happens when we do, when we actually start doing the work of, of leading and teaching. And we also said that, that growth happens when I stay, when I stick it out when the going gets tough, but I continue on anyway. This week, uh, we're going to talk about how to overcome doubt and unbelief. And it comes from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 to 19. And the author of Hebrews, you can open your Bibles or your devices, or we'll have it on the screen. He says this, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So the author of Hebrews is connecting these two ideas. One, uh, why were they so disobedient in the wilderness? And because of their unbelief. Uh, somehow for the author of Hebrews, those two things are, are intertwined. They're, they're the same. Disobedience is caused by a lack of belief. And I, I think we would see this to be true in our own lives. What What does it say about me when I uh, scream at my kids when they're misbehaving and I go, man, I shouldn't have done that? More importantly, if I truly knew who I was and who they were made in the image of God and who God is and all of the grace that, that God has for us, if I really believed that and it shaped my heart, how would I behave? I do that with anything, right? If, I, if I am particularly selfish in a moment, what does that mean about my belief system, about how my heart is formed, about what I truly believe? If I, if I doubt that God can answer a specific prayer, what is that saying about my beliefs? And so how does my disobedience inform what I truly believe, right? Another way you could think about that is, Man, if someone were to look at my life and, and just paid attention to my schedule, saw the things that I prioritized, saw how much time I spent on the phone or binge watching series on Netflix or, or whatever it is that I'm giving my time to, what does that say about the things that I believe to be important to me? How are my actions informing what I really, really believe? And so the author of Hebrews says, man, their disobedience comes from their unbelief. And there are, there's one thing that he's emphasizing to help address unbelief. And, and maybe it's unbelief in God in general. Unbelief, maybe it's this 
I'm, I'm not sure what I believe when it comes to my whole worldview. But maybe it's unbelief in uh, facets of our faith where we recognize that that one person has incredible faith that God will answer their prayers. And if I'm honest, sometimes I'm, I'm lacking in that belief. Yes, I believe, but help me with my unbelief. Or maybe I believe that God is God and that God answers prayers, but I struggle to believe that he'll actually answer my prayer. Maybe there's a facet of unbelief somewhere in my faith. And the author of Hebrews says, man, it is all about community. I mean, that's his, his answer. He wants us to encourage one another. He says, brothers and sisters, see to it that none of you have your hearts hardened by sin's deceit. He wants us to have this solidarity. He wants our faith to continue to the end, that we would hold our original conviction. And all of this is wrapped up in this idea of being a community of believers that's there for each other. And so I want to share three ways that community helps us to overcome unbelief. The first is that community softens my heart. So there's this uh, Australian, he's born in Hong Kong and he's Chinese ethnicity, but, but he's got this thick Australian accent and he's fascinating to see and listen to. And uh, his name's Sam Chan and he's an evangelist and a theologian. And he says that all of us have plausibility structures. Plausibility structures are basically a mechanism in your brain, if you will, that is red flagging certain information. And so it's a gatekeeper for truth. And we have different plausibility structures. So when I say Bigfoot, all of us, hopefully in this room, our plausibility structures flag that word and go, no, it's not plausible. Maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I haven't taken a poll yet. Um, you know, at, uh, when we say different words, um, flat earth or global warming or essential oils. Some of you, when I say essential oils, you get your wallets out and you're ready to start buying. And some of you are like, what is that voodoo nonsense? Uh, if, if you were in Minneapolis and you hurt your arm, you might not go to a doctor's office. You might go to get a healing crystal, right? And so depending on where you are, there's different plausibility structures too, geographically. And uh, one of the things that really informs our plausibility structures is community. So let's take Bigfoot, for example. Man, if I told you, we're just sitting down for coffee together, and I'm like, hey, I was in Sam Houston National Forest the other day, and I'm not saying I saw Bigfoot, but I am saying I saw a creature that looked a lot like Bigfoot. You know, you might, you might be like, man, what is, I'm, I don't really want to have coffee with this guy anymore. Well, um, right? And so, but if, if, if we're talking in a small group, say, and I say, hey, man, I know this is going to sound crazy, guys, but I think I saw something that looked like Bigfoot. And somebody else was like, hey, was it right outside of New Waverly? Because I think I saw something that kind of looked like Bigfoot, but I didn't want to say anything. All right, now our interest has peaked just a little bit. Man, if half of the room was saying to us, yeah, of course, everybody knows, right outside of New Waverly, some sort of creature that looks like Bigfoot. I'm not saying it's Bigfoot. You know, then all of a sudden, we want to investigate. If all of the room, except for you, says, man, everybody knows about that. Yeah, I've seen it. Now you're planning a trip. I'm not saying you believe in Bigfoot, but now you're at least planning a trip, and you're like, I got to see this for myself. And so what happens is our community shapes our plausibility structures. Oftentimes, uh, we tend to do evangelism by ourselves. So we'll go to a secular book club, and we will join that in hopes of sharing our faith. But what happens is we are the one uh, outlier of the group 
who really believes in the Bible and Christianity and, and we're kind of strange. And it's not really impacting people's plausibility structures. And so Sam Chan says, instead, what you need to do is you need to invite people into your Christian community. Invite people into uh, your small group. Invite people into your home. And all of a sudden, what happens is they begin to see, man, these people are loving. These people are wise. These people are good for their community. I really enjoy being around these people. And somehow I'm the only one that doesn't believe this really strange idea that all these other people believe. I think that's fair to say the idea that God the Son took on flesh, lived a perfect life, uh, died for our sins, and, and rose again and defeated death. And if we put our faith in Him, we can be forgiven. Man, that is a big belief system to throw on somebody all at once. And if you have a whole group of people that are believing this and some of them are nuclear physicists and and some of them are lawyers and all of them are completely reasonable, you're at least going to go, maybe this is worth looking into. Community impacts our plausibility structures. And so we see how community softens our heart. Community also softens our heart by by seeing somebody's life changed by the power of God. And I say that because partly I want to encourage you, if there's a part of your life that's not surrendered, and I think I say this primarily because that was my story uh, all throughout uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, early college. There were so many parts of my life that didn't really reflect Christ Um, And all of a sudden, when I started taking my faith seriously and and really following Jesus with everything I had and just surrendering all of those parts of my life that were unsurrendered, people would have looked at me and they would have said, there's real power in God. I mean, I can look at somebody's life and see God do a work. And I think we've all experienced that before, where we've known somebody They've given their life to Christ, and they're a totally different person afterwards. In fact, I remember a college chapel service where we were all taking communion, and there was this kid there who uh, just got under my skin, and, uh, and maybe because I related to him a lot, but um, he was kind of a class clown and didn't take anything seriously, and we were taking communion, and I saw him, he was sitting with some, some, some girls and some friends of his, and he takes communion, that wafer, and he goes, <clears throat> I thought, man, that's so disrespectful, and I was so angry of him to, to treat communion so lightly and make a joke out of it. I wish I could say I prayed for him. I don't really know what I did in that moment, but... Um, He came to college again after that summer and I walked into his room because I was a hall chaplain and uh, he was a totally different person. I visited with him a little while and I was about to leave and I turned around and I said, what happened to you? And he said, he said he had an experience with God. And God completely changed him. And he was taking his faith seriously and and living for Jesus. He didn't even have to tell me that. I mean, he just was different. Different enough that I went, man, what happened to you? Community softens my heart by showing me the evidence of God. That can be you. I mean, if there's something in your life that that isn't surrendered to God, let me just say, surrender it and let God use that as part of his story, as part of your story and your testimony of his power at work in your life. As quick as you can, just give it to God. Community softens my heart. Community also opens my eyes. The 
the author of Hebrews talks about not just having our hearts hardened, but having them hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And so part of the way that community helps me is it helps me to be undeceived. Uh, So community will open my eyes. It will open my eyes to sin. It will open my eyes to sin in my life. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before. I'm sure you have, where you experience temptation and you have this justification for why this particular sin isn't sin for you in that moment. And if you're lucky, you talk to somebody else before you make that decision to sin and you say, here's what I'm thinking. And whatever comes out of your mouth next, the moment it comes out, you're like, man, that, that sounds so foolish. That's the, I mean, it doesn't hold water. Man, the moment I have to put it to words and make that abstract thought a sentence, ah, it just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. And the moment I say it, I'm like, no, you're right. Oh, that doesn't, that doesn't work. <laughs> that's, still, that's still sin for me. Or maybe after the fact. Someone finds out your sin, and you're confronted with that. And you go, yeah, man, I don't know what I was thinking. Community opens my heart, or opens my eyes, to uh, sin. Community also opens my eyes to grace. Oh man, does it ever. Oftentimes, you have a secret sin that you hold on to, and you think... I'm not going to tell anybody this, because if I do, they'll view me differently. But one of the things that that lie is saying to you is, there's something that happened in my life, and if people knew about it, they would love me less. And so we think, subconsciously, this is the lie. Something has happened to me that makes me unlovable. If people really knew me, they would no longer love me. And when you're in a community that you feel safe enough to be fully known, and you share that with somebody, brother or sister in Christ who turns to you and says, man, I respect you so much more for having told me that. That must have taken a lot of courage. Or, man, God died for that sin a long time ago. Jesus died for that sin a long time ago. And that does not define you. And I love you. And I don't love you any less for knowing that about you now. And all of a sudden we see, oh man, I'm not defined by that sin. And, and, And of course I can believe that God forgives me because here's this imperfect Christian brother that is is forgiving me. And if it's easy for him, then then it's got to be easy for God too. And we see our eyes are open to God's grace by our community. Our eyes are also open to God's power by our community. If, If you could think for a moment a tangible way that God has been at work in your life this last week. And if we had you write it down, some of us would be writing. Some of us would not be writing. And if we were to get together and share, we would see the different ways that God was at work. And so our eyes would be open to God's power because we would be exposed to other people that were experiencing God moving in their life. If you were a part of uh, the men's Bible study that I went to on Thursday morning, or if I even told you about it, you would be like, man, that's so good to hear about how God was at work in that. And so we had a, a, we're going to launch small groups. And I'm so excited about it. Man, I, I can't wait. We've got these short-term groups that are called Connect Groups. And they're primarily for connection and content. And so if you're like, I wish I knew more people. I want to get to know people. I want to be better connected. Those are for you. They're seven weeks long. We've got six of them launching the first week of October. So you can hear about them at our small group fair after this. There will be donuts and coffee, I think. And, uh, and we've also got community groups. We've got one of them. It's a long-term group. 
And hopefully some of those short-term groups will become community groups. But the idea of community groups is that you grow in and live out Christian community. They're less about connecting with a lot of people and more about committing to some people and bearing one another's burdens and caring for each other and pursuing God together. Well, at my last church, we had a small group, and I love this story from them. They, at the end of their small group meeting, they all shared prayer requests, and then they all prayed for each other. They took those requests home, and they continued to pray for them throughout the week. The next time they gathered together, every single member of their small group had their prayer request answered, and they got to see God at work. And they went, man, every, some, some of them probably went, I should have prayed to win the lottery <laughs> if I had known that was going to happen. They got to see God's power at work. Community opens our eyes. And lastly, community cements our faith. John Wesley and George Whitfield, two famous evangelists from long ago, I should really remember when they preached, from a bygone era, they, uh, they're, they're attributed with bringing tens of thousands to Christ. John Wesley, uh, you could make the argument that he brought over 100,000 people to Christ. George Whitfield preached to millions the gospel. And George Whitfield gets to the end of his life in ministry, and he says, my followers are a rope of sand compared to John Wesley." So John Wesley was a part of the Methodist movement. And the reason that they were called Methodists was because they had a method for discipleship, a method for growing in your faith. And it was basically that you would get involved in a small group. That there was a community of Christians that would come around you and hold you accountable and want to see you growing in your faith. George Whitfield gets to the end of his life and he goes, I don't know who my people are, I don't know where my people are. I don't even know if my people are, if they're still Christians. My people are a rope of sand. And he wishes that he had focused as much on discipleship as he did on evangelism. And he recognizes the longevity of John Wesley's, of those that came to faith because of John Wesley, because they were involved in community. Community cements our faith. And so the writer of Hebrews says, I want you to hold on to your original conviction. And one of the ways that he's trying to get them to do that is by encouraging one another. Community also cements our faith in this last way. When, when we've kind of alluded to it before, when you share your story, we've got a small group that is specifically focused on on learning to share their stories and, uh, and sharing their stories with each other if they're comfortable. I don't want to say too much, but I think that's what's happening. And uh, part of what happens when you share your faith is you cement your faith because you take this idea from ambiguous and abstract and you speak it, which means you need to string words together that form a coherent sentence. And once that happens you have a whole thought or a whole idea. And so your story of God goes from ambiguous to concrete. Even the simple act of sharing your faith will help to cement it. So if you're dealing with unbelief or you know other people that are, the answer is community. Whether it's unbelief about God or just unbelief about God's power and his activity and his presence and his ability to answer prayer, community will soften your heart, will open your eyes, and will cement your faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I'm, I'm so grateful for the next season of life in our church, for the next step that you're calling us to, this focus on community and fellowship and, and caring for each other and connecting and committing. Lord, we see just how incredibly important community is. 
And so, Father, we pray that as we lean into this season of community, that you would use it, that you would use it powerfully, that we would be excited to invite people into this community, that we would, Lord, recognize that community will soften our hearts and open our eyes and cement our faith. And so, Lord, will you bless us as we jump into it and as we seek to, to be faithful to what you're calling our church to next. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.